Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another installment of the Neurointerventional Webinar. I'm Jacob Fleming, the Chair of the Neurointerventional Service Line of the SIR Resident Fellow Section. I'm very pleased to welcome back to deliver a webinar Dr. Eli Zimmerman, who is uh, an amazing teacher. I uh, was fortunate enough to work with in medical school, and as I said, he's been uh, nice enough to deliver a webinar now uh, on two separate occasions and so I'm thrilled to have him back so dr zimmerman went to medical school at vanderbilt he then completed training in neurology residency and vascular neurology stroke fellowship at mass general hospital and brigham and women's he then came back and began as faculty at vanderbilt and I was fortunate enough to have him as my clerkship director in my neurology clerkship. And he has a supreme knack for breaking down the complexities of neuroscience in a way that's extremely memorable. I still remember things from uh, more than three years ago that I learned from him. And uh, he presents it in an understandable and a very patient-centered way. So excited to have him back talk about this very important topic, which is uh, about a clinical treatment of acute ischemic stroke. And uh, this is a big topic, and I think that Dr. Zimmerman is going to explore some elements that uh, we as uh, radiology interested medical students or radiology residents may not have the opportunity to get a lot of exposure to. So as I said, very excited. And with that said, we'll let Dr. Zimmerman take it away. Hey everybody, Jacob, thanks so much for the kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, coming through just fine. Okay, great. So my my special I specialize in the clinical care of stroke patients. And so hope to impart sort of the the basic stuff with some complicated stuff for folks who are not neurologists, which is all of you guys. So um, there's plenty of time built in if folks have questions. Uh, I don't know the best way to do that, whether it's on the chat thing here or just shout it out, um, but yeah, people people can just uh, send in their questions. Uh, either there's a question tab or in the chat. Either of those is fine, and um, we'll definitely take some time at the end to answer any questions. Perfect. And that'll probably be the best way to do it. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna talk talk about a few things today. The first question that I always like to think about is why this matters. I think one of the things that neurology especially stroke neurology gets a bad rap for is you know well the stroke happened what can you do about it and i think fortunately even in the 10 years or so that i've been in residency and on faculty um that the the tides have turned i'm glad to say so talk about why this stuff matters talk about some fundamentals in the acute evaluation and management of stroke patients um, and then in thinking about beyond the initial initial hospitalization phase so i always like to start with a case um, this is sort of a combination of real patients and made up patients. But so the case we're going to talk about is a 71 year old man. He has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, who comes to the ER after being found by his wife with left sided weakness and left facial droop. They went to bed last night around 1030 and she woke up at 630 to come walk the dogs. He wasn't up at 715, which was unusual. So she came to find him and he was tangled up in the sheets. So she noticed that his face was he had facial droop and she called EMS and it's now 7.50. So first question is why does this matter? So this is as of the most recent um, stroke statistics from, from this year. Stroke is the number five cause of mortality in the United States, and about 800,000 people have new or recurrent stroke every year, which is about 600,000 people have new strokes and 185 or so thousand have recurrent strokes, and that's just in the US. Um, and again, just in the US, someone has a stroke every 40 seconds, and someone dies from a stroke every four minutes. Um, the most recent statistics on the cost of stroke were from five years ago now, but the cost of stroke between medical care plus lost wages, et cetera, is $45.5 billion per year. Um, so, you know, it's pretty tremendous impact that this single disease, that this single disease has. So there was this great, there's this great paper from a while ago now about time is brain which I think is a pretty cool way to think about, you know, again, why I do what I do in the, in, the critical, in the critical care of these stroke patients. But for every minute that a large vessel is occluded, carotid, MCA, ACA, 
2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and 7.5 miles of myelinated fiber are destroyed. And that's per minute. So, you know, some of the times that we hear about patients who, oh, well, I was feeling okay, but then I thought it might go away. So I took a nap and then they nap for five hours and can't get reperfusion sort of therapy. You know, just like it's heartbreaking to hear that because think about how much is lost during that time. So just some fundamentals in terms of terminology and such. So ischemic stroke, which is what we're gonna talk about today, is an episode of neurologic dysfunction caused by focal, focal infarction, be it in the brain, the spinal cord, or the retina, and that meaning, infarction meaning cell death attributable to ischemia either by imaging or clinical evidence. Um, I saw a patient in clinic about two hours ago with a spinal cord infarct, which is sometimes a forgotten child of ischemic stroke, but any of these three places count as an ischemic stroke. Um, some terminology things, so infarct, ischemic or ischemia, and stroke. So the way I was taught is that infarct is what you see on imaging, and stroke is what the patient has. So the, M the MRI doesn't show an MCA stroke. The, M the MRI shows infarct in the MCA territory. The patient has an MCA stroke. Um, and ischemic or ischemia is cell death because of lack of oxygen or lack of blood flow. I see the term CVA a lot. It was an old-timey term, cerebrovascular accident that I think most neurologists would get chest pain if you said that. Um, I always think it's not really usually an accident, um, but that's not a term that I, I say or typically like. So, okay, so five causes of stroke on this. This is just sort of generic, generic MRI, um, GWI sequences of patients with stroke. So top left looks like a right MCA territory infarct. The, the next two, the one on the top in the middle, the one on the right, look like small vessel territory strokes, the one in the middle on the ponds, the one on the right side of the screen on the crone radiata. Um, the bottom left, you see infarct in both the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere and the anterior and posterior circulations. So that's a good look for embolic stroke, perhaps a, a proximal source given that it's both hemispheres. And then on the bottom right, that's in the MCA, ACA watershed or border zone. So Let's talk about different types of stroke. So there was this trial from back in the 90s called the TOAST trial, which is actually a horrible name for a stroke trial. Um, but it was a trial of a heparinoid product for the acute management of stroke. So it turns out the, 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 that medication didn't work. It was a negative trial. Um, but it's kind of crazy because that trial was from the 90s. And that was really the first time that anybody thought to differentiate the different types of stroke by etiology. And if you think about um, what causes one stroke versus another, they're really totally different, totally different beasts. So I always think the big three are the first three on this list. And we'll talk about these in, in more detail, but the five in this TOAST trial, as they named them, were large artery atherosclerosis, cardioembolism, small vessel occlusion, stroke of other determined etiology, and we'll talk about what these mean, and stroke of undetermined etiology. So Large artery atherosclerosis are the ones that I outlined in blue on this picture, it represents about 30% of stroke. Um, so the most common thing that I think people think about with a large artery atherosclerosis is diseases of the carotids, either progressive narrowing of the carotid, which is actually less common than arterioembolic stroke, so atherosclerotic plaques sending junk up into the brain. But two things are being more and more recognized as causes of atherosclerosis-related stroke. So one is aortic arch plaque or aortic arch atheroma. And number two is something that um, we see a lot in Nashville that we see a lot in Middle Tennessee is intracranial atherosclerosis for reasons that are not clear to, maybe someone knows them, I don't know why, um, but that tends to be a process that is more common in people of non-white, of non-white origin. So more common in African-Americans and people of Asian descent, people who are Hispanic, I'm not sure why, but that is a pretty common disease process in those ethnic groups. Number two in the red boxes here are sources of cardioembolic stroke. So the biggie, of course, that we think about with cardioembolic stroke is AFib. Um, but don't forget things like valvular disease or someone with an EF of 10% who has an LV thrombus. Um, or I sort of put aortic arch plaque on both of these categories. And then last of these big three, is small vessel occlusion or lacunar stroke, which is from the little small like lenticulostriates or pontine perforators that are the um, branches off of the main vessels. The analogy that I always use is 
This is sort of like if you had a gravel driveway coming off of the highway for the, the pathology that happens right at that 90 degree angle is pretty unique to the, the brain in this, in, this part of, in this particular type of stroke. So the other two, this one called other determined etiology is the smallest sliver of stroke. Um, and I was thinking about Virchow's triad for this. So whether it's endothelial injury because of, of carotid dissection for someone who went to the chiropractor or someone who was on a long plane ride and has a DVT and then has a PFO or someone who has a factor V Leiden um, deficiency, those are other determined etiologies, meaning something weird caused it. It wasn't the first three big categories that we just talked about, but it was something that you can figure out what caused the stroke. Then the last court category, which is probably the most frustrating for patients, for stroke neurologists, is stroke of undetermined etiology or cryptogenic stroke. So the, the, biggest, the biggest category of this is where you've done the whole workout, you've done all the stuff that we'll talk about, and you just don't find a cause, or someone has 80% carotid stenosis and AFib, and you don't know like what caused the stroke that day because there are, like this says in bullet number two here, multiple competing causes for the stroke. Okay, so let's get back to our case. This is our 71-year-old man. He has multiple stroke risk factors. He's with his wife at 10.30 p.m. when they go to bed, he's normal. She gets up at 6.30. He's not up 45 minutes later. He has a facial droop and she calls EMS. Okay. So he gets, you know, EMS brings him to the ER. And here we have what's called a stroke alert or a code stroke. And that gets called and the stroke scale is 14. So let's talk about the stroke scale for a minute. Um, you probably are familiar with this, but it is a validated objective neurologic exam. Does it count for your whole neuro exam? Not really, but in the acute setting, you know, when you need to get information quickly, this MA stroke scale is a great way to do it. This is one of the, um, this little kitchen scene is the, I think the picture that people think about the most when they think of the stroke scale where you ask a patient to describe this and you can assess a lot based on their ability to do that. Are they awake enough to answer the question? Do they see the mom with the doing the dishes with the water coming out of the sink? Do they neglect the kids on the left side? Do they know the word cookies, that sort of thing? So the total range you can get on the stroke scale is from zero to 42, um, but that is if both sides are abnormal. So I would say typically like the most severe sort of unilateral left MCA stroke would be a stroke scale of 20 or 22 or 25. Some of the things that um, the stroke scale is weighted towards, the biggest two are motor and language. So when you do the stroke scale, you get four points for each arm and three points for your face. So that, you know, the motor components of the exam are 19, you know, each side being eight um, for the arms and the legs. And the language components of the stroke scale are seven points. So as we think about what's a major stroke, what's a minor stroke, you know, if someone has a stroke scale of two, but it's their dominant arm, then that would be disabling. Or if it's someone who's a truck driver who has a stroke scale of one because of a visual field deficit, that would be disabling as well. So this patient's stroke scale is 14. He has right gaze deviation. He has left facial weakness. His left arm is plegic. Four is the highest you can get for arm. His left leg is two, which means he can lift at anti-gravity, um, but it falls to the bed in 10 seconds. He has um, partial sensory loss on the left side. He has one point for dysarthria, two for neglect. So he's rolling into the ER. Stroke scale is not low. So first thing you do, easy stuff. So make sure his he's, ABCs are okay, obviously. And then make sure that it's not symptomatic hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. So finger stick is a little bit up, but okay. So thinking about what do we do next for this guy? So imaging. So get a non-con head CT. If I'm looking at this, this looks pretty okay. People sort of their eyes jump out at here, which is just the normal sylvium fissure on the left and the head's a little bit off kilter, so you can't see it quite as well on the right, but this is a normal head CT. So then the question becomes, can you give this guy IVTPA? And unfortunately, the answer is no, because he was last known well last night, and it's now 7.15 in the morning. So let's talk about IVTPA for AIS acute ischemic stroke for a minute. So the NINDS trial was the first trial to look at IVTPA, and that was back in the mid-90s. And really, you know, of all the things that have revolutionized stroke neurology, this is, you know, probably in the top two or three. 
So in 1995, this trial was done and it was FDA approved very quickly. Um, interestingly, there are two parts of this trial and one part looked at improvement in 24 hours and that part was negative. People who got TPA didn't just like bop up out of the bed and they were good to go in 24 hours, but the benefit was at 90 days. And if you look at this little figure on the right, um, this shows like 100, these 100 little men who get IV TPA and their outcomes based on TPA. So one of the things that I personally do a lot of is telestroke or teleneurology. And I have to not convince, but give like the, the fast plug for someone to think that, to realize that IV TPA is a safe therapy. So the way I interpret this, this figure for folks who don't know the, the data is I basically say, you know, if you give a TPA to 100 people, 32 are going to do better because of it. 13 will be normal or almost normal. 19 will be better. And of those 100, six will have some bleeding in their brain. And of those six, two will get worse and one will die. So if I have to like give my TPA pep talk in five seconds, I'll say you're 10 times more likely to have a good outcome than a bad outcome because of TPA because there's 32 little green men and three little red men in this picture. So that was in 1995, and that approved TPA for the zero to three hour window. And then there was an ECAS-3 trial, which was done in 2008. E stands for European, and this has not been FDA approved, but we it's sort of the standard of care of stroke in the States, um, which approved TPA for an extended window up to four and a half hours. But within that three to four and a half hour window, there are a few contraindications to TPA. The combination of both stroke and diabetes, this previous stroke, not the current stroke that the patient's in the ER for, um, a high stroke scale, age over 80, or any anticoagulation use. So unfortunately for this patient, can't get IVA TPA because of the last known well. So what else might we do for this person? How about a CTA? He had a pretty classic right MCA syndrome with cortical manifestations. He had neglect, he had a gaze deviation, and sure enough, on this CTA right here, you see the right MCA is occluded. So think about, let's talk about endovascular therapy of acute stroke for a little bit. So I remember when I was in med school, this was, I graduated in 2010, this was still a pretty relatively new thing and we were doing a lot of intra-arterial TPA and early thrombectomy. And so there was the national, like the International Stroke Conference was in, in 2013, and there were three big trials released, these three right here, IMS3, synthesis expansion, and MRSQ, that looked at thrombectomy for stroke patients. And to everybody's sort of shock and disappointment, these three trials were negative. And everybody in the stroke world thought, well, that's crap because obviously we do these things a lot and patients walk out of the hospital normal in two days, that cannot be. And so ultimately that came down to patient selection, the wrong imaging being done. There are patients who were enrolled in this trial without even the confirmation of a target for thrombectomy. So two years later in 2015, there were five additional endovascular trials released. All were different based on imaging or patient population. That's beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but all five of these trials were so overwhelmingly in favor of treatment that like the others that were still ongoing were stopped early. And these were done for endovascular therapy within six hours of the last known well time. And you know, the, of all the things, like I said, of all the things that have changed the face of stroke care in the last however many years, this I think is number one. Because if you look at the number needed to treat with thrombectomy for someone to have a good outcome, for these, for, for thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke, it's like two or three people have to be treated for one to have a good outcome where they walk out of the hospital. So in the last couple of years, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, two additional trials were released looking at extended window thrombectomy in the six to 24 or six to 16 hour window. And those are the Dawn and Diffuse 3 trials. So one of the things that I was asked to talk about is thinking about how we evaluate the benefit of these trials. And so one of them is the, we use the modified Rankin scale or MRS, where it ranges from zero to six. Um, so zero is normal, six is dead. And the way that I think about it is the big boundaries between three and four. Three and below, you can walk. Above three, so four and five, you can't walk. So zero is normal. One means you have some symptoms, but it doesn't cause any disability. Number two on this scale is you can't do everything you used to be able to do, but you can still live independently. 
Number three means you need a lot of help, but you still can walk, even with assistance with a with a walker or cane or whatever. Four is you need lots of assistance and you cannot walk. And five means bed bound needing 24 hour care. And like I said, six is, is dead. So in looking at endovascular therapy, these are this is a meta-analysis of the five big endovascular trials. They looked at people with a modified ranking scale of zero, one, or two as meaning a good outcome, meaning they can live about they can live their life, they have some disability that affects them a little bit, but they can still get by pretty okay. And so overall, the numbers don't don't focus too much on those. But basically, in the overall population, the top of this, the top of these two bars shows the modified ranking scale zero to six, zero is in the lightest white, six is in the darkest blue. And that of these of these patients that were enrolled in these endovascular trials, 26.5% ended up with uh, zero, one, or two, so a good outcome in the control population, where 46% of these trials, which is amazing, of the people in these trials ended up with a zero, one, or two on the modified ranking scale. And that was whether or not they received IVTPA, which is the bottom, the bottom four bars. So let's say the CTA shows this proximal M1 occlusion. So now what? One of the things that um, fortuitously at Vanderbilt, we've been doing CT perfusion for as long as I can remember, which is when I was back in med school and whatever, the late 2000s. Um, and that was in vogue for a while and then sort of out of vogue. And now perfusion imaging has really become one of the mainstays of stroke care. So here we get, I always call it like the idiot proof thing. So that when I'm on call and it's two o'clock in the morning, I guess sort of like open my eyes, look at the scan and say, yeah, oh, it's good, mostly green, good news versus eh, mostly red, bad news. So let's talk about how this CT perfusion gets calculated. You guys who are in, you know, going into radiology or radiology residents probably know more than I do about this, but I'll tell you the neurologist understanding of CT perfusion imaging. So the way I think about it is as this imaging uses contrast as a surrogate of blood flow and looks at a few variables. So on the x-axis here is time, on the y-axis is blood flowing in and out of a particular voxel on the scan. So we measure, you know, sort of a normal bell-shaped curve of blood flowing in and out. So we measure a handful of variables, a handful of variables based on this. Number one is CBV, cerebral blood volume. That is, over the course of however many seconds, how much total blood gets gets delivered to that spot. Um, I'm not the best math sort of dude, but it's like the integral of the area under this curve. So how much blood ends up getting there, the blood volume over time. Number two on the left is MTT, which stands for mean transit time, or TTP stands for time to peak. That is, presuming this is a normal distribution, how long does it take for the average or the peak of this blood to get into the given spot? And then CBF, cerebral blood flow, is just the volume over time, which is the slope of that curve. A derivative, I think. All right. So in the setting of ischemia, meaning there is decreased blood flow because of a vessel occlusion or a vessel narrowing, blood is still getting where it needs to go, but it just has to go the long way to get there, sort of going around through collaterals or through a stenosed vessel. And so that curve sort of gets pulled out and stretched and flattened a little bit. So let's look at these variables. The mean transit time goes up. It takes longer for the average drop of blood to get there because it has to go through collaterals or whatever. The average flow goes down because it's just taking more time to get there, but CBV, cerebral blood volume, is unchanged. And that's the key, is that that curve gets sort of flattened and smushed and spread out, but overall the area under that curve is the same as though it was the normal curve. And then the pathologic, or the more pathologic state is infarction, where that curve gets even more stretched and flattened. That mean transit time goes way up, takes way too long for blood to get there. Blood's not getting there at all. CBV, which is the critical thing, goes down. Not enough blood is getting to the area of the brain that is now becoming infarcted. And because of those two things, CBF, blood flow, the rate of blood flow, the blood, the blood volume over time goes way down. So let's look at these things. So this patient had a right hemisphere sort of situation. And if you look, I always think it sort of looked like the, you know, like magic eye things where you like cross your eyes and then like the giraffe pops out. These are a little bit hard to see and the scales are flipped. But if you look at CBV ranging from low in blue to high in red, 
if you look side to side, they look pretty symmetric. You can maybe see a few little patchy areas where, like in this area right here, it's a little more blue than it is red on the, on, on the left hemisphere, but it looks pretty symmetric, which is a good thing because you want the brain to be ischemic, but not yet infarcted, so that thrombectomy, aka pulling the clot out, will be successful in restoring blood flow. CBF, which is the slope of that curve, red is high, blue is low, and you see in the right hemisphere here, blood flow is decreased in the right hemisphere compared to the left hemisphere. And looking at time to peak and mean transit time, where red is low and blue is high, there's lots more blue in the right hemisphere, meaning blood is taken longer to get there than it is in the left hemisphere, which is more greens and yellows and reds. So we put those things together to get this, like I said, the like idiot proof red green thing. And look at the little labels of, the, of what the green and red say. So red is the ship has sailed, that part of the brain has already, is, has already infarcted because there's INC where it says increased mean transit time and reduced CBV, meaning the blood's taken too long to get there and not enough is getting there, reduced CBV. And the green part, which is the salvageable penumbra, as opposed to the red, which is the ischemic core, the green is increased mean transit time. The blood's taken too long to get there, but normal CBV, meaning that overall the amount of blood that's getting there is what it needs to be. So this is an angiogram for this patient. It's a cr uh, common carotid injection here on the right, or I guess it's an internal carotid injection here on the right. And you see as you follow the carotid up, and you can see that ECA fills because of the distal occlusion here in the right MCA. And then boom, post thrombectomy. There's still a little bit of stenosis there, but the area distal to that, what was occluded before, has now been reperfused. Okay, so let's talk about acute management of these patients and then how we work them up and then secondary prevention. So based on those five things in the TOAST trial, I always use that to sort of guide my thinking about how we, what workup we do for the typical stroke patient. So in thinking about cardioembolic sources of stroke, we do a, an echo and prolonged cardiac monitoring, something that for me at least was had fallen like out of vogue and is now back in back in vogue is looking for a PFO. So the PFO closure trials, the five-year results were released a few years ago and basically showed no benefit to PFO closure. But the 10-year results were released in the last couple of years, and that shows that at 10 years, patients with PFO closure do better than those who don't who have not had their PFO closed with certain PFO characteristics. So echo, preferably with some sort of bubble study or some sort of analysis of intracardiac shunting. Um, and number two is prolonged cardiac monitoring. So even when I was in residency, which was not that long ago, the standard of care was just to do a 24-hour cardiac monitor or Holter monitor. But some data came out that basically as you increase that to do 30-day monitoring or longer, you basically triple your odds of finding atrial fibrillation which is the point of doing that in the first place, because that of all the things we're gonna talk about, changing someone from aspirin to anticoagulation is something that really changes outcomes tremendously. So those are thinking about um, cardioembolic sources of stroke. In purple there is looking at causes of, or contributors to small vessel disease. Um, and I always think of small vessel or lacunar stroke as sort of a risk factor kind of stroke. So we think about lipid panel looking at an LDL, Think about diabetes and looking at a hemoglobin A1C. And then in blue, vessel imaging, thinking about um, large artery atherosclerosis, is there an arterioembolic cause? Is this someone who has a high-grade stenosis of the right ICA and they have a right MCA territory stroke? And then in green is where you sort of go nuts with all the stroke workup stuff you can do, whether it's a hypercoagulable workup or genetic testing for like Fabrase or Catacil or whatever, that's in trying to find the other determined causes of stroke. So as we think about the management of stroke patients, um, I don't know whether I invented this or I found this somewhere, but it's sort of A, B, C, D, E, F, and we'll talk about all these things. So A is for antithrombotic therapy, which encompasses both anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. So the I have some some um, colored things here. The red is the acute is going to relate to acute management. 
and blue is recently recently um, published clinical trials. So, um, or at least highly cited ones. So antithrombotic therapy, best evidence is that this needs to be started within 24 to 48 hours of acute stroke. Someone has gotten IVTPA, then we wait at least 24 hours before starting aspirin or Plavix or anticoagulation. So I'm thinking about antiplatelet therapy, the mainstays are aspirin and Plavix. Typically, um, for someone with a new first stroke, aspirin monotherapy is sufficient. Um, as far as the dose, it doesn't really matter. 81 is fine. 325 is fine. There's not a, there's not a ton, ton of data to guide which, which dose we do. So there is increasing evidence based on the chance and point trials, which are recent, you know, in the last two or three or four years, that a short duration of aspirin plus Plavix can be beneficial. So in the chance trial, the C stands for Chinese, was three weeks of dual therapy, and in point, it was three months of dual therapy. But at some point, the risk-benefit curves of too much bleeding and stroke prevention cross, and you basically outweigh your stroke benefit with increasing bleeding risk. So we don't leave patients on aspirin and Plavix forever and ever because at some point, like I said, the, the bleed risk outpaces the stroke prevention, um, but there's increasing evidence, and these trials looked at patients with minor stroke or with TIA, that there is a benefit to a short term of dual therapy, aspirin plus Plavix. There are other sort of more unusual agents Agronox, which is dipritamol plus aspirin, and silastazol, there's, I would say those are, if you're starting those de novo, good for you, but that's, I would say that's a, that typically ends up being a stroke specialist sort of thing that um, can be helpful in certain situations. And then in this antithrombotic therapy category, thinking about anticoagulation, it was thought that with the, the advent of the NOAX, the non-warfarin agents, um, like Xarelto and Pradaxa and such, that there would be a benefit to starting patients on those medications when we thought there was a cardioembolic source of stroke, AFib, for example. But unfortunately, in the either one or two or three trials that have come out about embolic stroke, though that actually turns out to not be the case. And really, we reserve anticoagulation for people with proven AFib or other hypercoagulable states or DVTs or reasons to be on anticoagulation. Um, the, there are trials in the last five years comparing the novel agents to warfarin, and really at, the NOACs are at, at least not inferior to warfarin, um, and there's one of them, Apixaban, which is Eliquis, I think is really shaken out to be the most, the most used of those because it actually was basically in the trial was like so non-inferior that it was actually superior to warfarin. Okay, let's talk about blood pressure control. So one of the things that we think about with acute stroke is if someone is coming in with an acute ischemic stroke and their blood pressure is 210 over 100, then we think, gosh, maybe that blood pressure is the brain's autoregulation to say we got to push past the stenosis or the clot that's there or whatever. And so there probably is some benefit to acute permissive hypertension. Letting someone who comes into the ER with a blood pressure of, like I said, 210 over 110, just sort of ride high for a few days. But that definitely goes away by at least day two, definitely day three. So when thinking about the secondary prevention of stroke with blood pressure control, this is the number one modifiable risk factor for stroke. If you can do one thing for your stroke patients um, from a risk factor modification standpoint, blood pressure is the most beneficial one. Even in people who don't have pre-existing hypertension, just being on a low dose of an antihypertensive as much as their blood pressure can tolerate reduces the relative risk of stroke by about 25%. And by each 10 points you reduce to solid blood pressure, you decrease stroke risk by about a third. Um, again, back to when I was in med school 10 years ago, there was, it was the ACE, ACE inhibitors and hydrochlorothiazide were the mainstay, but in the time since then, really any blood pressure agent is beneficial um, and there's no real, no real preference for one versus the other. The C stands for cholesterol, and similarly, for every 40-point drop in LDL, you decrease stroke risk by about 20%. The SPARKLE trial looked at atorvastatin, 80 milligrams, and so that, again, if we're starting someone de novo on these medications, 80 of atorvastatin, unless it's a little, you know, a little 100-year-old nana who weighs, you know, 90 pounds, then 80 milligrams of atorvastatin is really the mainstay for that. Typically, we aim for an LDL of less than 100, 
unless they have diabetes or other cardiovascular risk factors, then we aim for less than 70. D stands for diabetes. Goal A1C is less than seven. And we really don't, there's no evidence for benefit of getting someone's A1C less than 6.5, because at some point, like the risk of hypoglycemia outweighs the stroke benefit. E stands for endarterectomy. And again, I feel like I keep harping on this, but it's just how much things have changed in the last few years that um, even 10 years ago, thinking about like the ACAST trial and the NASET trial, thinking about um, at what point do we do an endarterectomy, we really now in 2019 reserve CEA for people with clear symptoms referable to the disease vessel. So someone who, let's say they're getting a workup, they have um, syncope because they passed out while giving blood, and you find a 70% carotid stenosis, but they've never had any symptoms referable that, to that carotid, then that is not a person for whom you would do an endarterectomy. So the trials like ACAS and all those from back in the 80s and 90s were done before statins were in wide use, and now our medical management of stroke patients is so good that we really reserve CEA for people with clear carotid disease ipsilateral to where the stroke occurred. And then F is risk factors. I put this in here just to make sure I covered it, the um, therapy. So the FLAME trial looked at fluoxetine for motor recovery and stroke. That's something that um, is debated, but is probably beneficial for stroke patients is early initiation of fluoxetine, which is Prozac, um, in aiding motor recovery from stroke, even in people who don't have pre-existing mental health difficulties. So other things to think about in stroke patients, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, um, basically odds ratio of 2.25 or 2.24, that it increases your, your likelihood of stroke by a factor of two when it's untreated. Um, smoking, no surprise, increases stroke risk more in women than men. Um, there's a J curve to alcohol use that there's probably some benefit to having, you know, one, gla one glass of wine or whatever per day, but as you, get more than that, then the benefit starts going down. And then patients ask me a lot, you know, like, well, what can I do to prevent a stroke from happening or how can I, whatever. And I would say like, you got to do the things you know you got to do in terms of get exercise, eat healthy, lose weight, stop smoking. Um, and this just sort of drives that message home. That's what I got. We got 20 minutes or so for questions and I'm happy to, to answer whatever questions I can for you guys. Thanks for listening. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Zimmerman. Um, so everybody, if you have any questions, feel free to just put them in the question tab or the chat box. I have a few questions, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, so obviously, I, I think the, the crowd attending tonight is a bit biased towards being interested in the interventional side of things. Um, and as you presented, the data is really pretty astounding that's come out in the last few years. And this has also gotten a lot of attention in the mainstream press. I think there's a New York Times article and it's been uh, publicized in um, some other big uh, mainstream uh, media. And so obviously the word is kind of getting out about this procedure. And I think there's a perception among many people, uh, including a lot of medical professionals and including a lot of um, people interested in uh, interventional neuroradiology and that kind of thing, that it's kind of a, I don't want to say magic bullet, but that it's its like kind of a miracle procedure that you go in, pull clot out, and everything goes great. Um, but as we know, things are never really that simple. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask about is, uh, can you talk about some of the times when uh, thrombectomy maybe isn't a totally benign procedure. Uh, what are some of the potential complications you may see in post-procedural patients? Yeah, good question. So I think two things. I think one thing to not exactly answer your question, but about the success of this procedure. So again, one of the things that I do is facilitate transfers of patients who are in small community hospitals to a big tertiary facility to get this procedure. And one of the things that I'm always, I always try to be careful about doing is not promising things that I can't keep. So even if this patient, for example, had a stroke, you know, this patient that I talked about had a stroke scale of 14, you know, I think one of the worst things that I can do is say, well, let's get you transferred to Vanderbilt so we can get that clot pulled out. Um, you know, we, even with a stroke scale of that and a, and a 
syndrome that's highly suggestive of a large vessel occlusion, you never know what you're going to find on imaging. And so that's part of it. Part two is even in the best of circumstances, someone who's young and healthy, who has a stroke for whatever reason, who gets to the OR quickly to get the, the clot removed fast, sometimes depending on the state of collaterals, which is sort of the big key here, someone has really good collaterals, they can truck along for six, eight, 10, 12 hours versus someone who has bad collateral, bad, someone who has bad collaterals, they may go on to have a hemispheric infarct in a matter of you know, 45 minutes, 90 minutes, that sort of thing. Um, and then as far as to answer your question, Jacob, about um, risks, you know, obviously the procedural risk in terms of like groin hematoma, et cetera, pseudoaneurysm, but once you successfully reperfuse a part of the brain that's been infarcted or that's been ischemic for a while, you worry about reperfusion injury or hemorrhage, um, which is the main complication I think that we see. And that sometimes it's asymptomatic, sometimes it can be really symptomatic. I think it's pretty rare. And at least my experience here is that our interventionalists are pretty um, judicious about doing this procedure and saying, gosh, we've tried seven poles with the device and it's not working. Maybe we should stop now. Um, but I think those are the biggies. If that, if that is a complicated answer to a straightforward question. No, that's very good. Thank you. I think as you highlight um, the the data, I think is is easy to look at and and say this is such a great procedure because the number needed to treat is so low. But uh, looking at uh, Mr. Clean and and the others of those trials, the patient selection is very important. That's right. And, uh, obviously, based on the imaging, and then some of it, uh, I, I've heard. Uh, Neurointerventionalists say that a lot of it does come down to luck with those uh, collaterals. That's right. That's right. We don't know, um, you know, how how the patient is necessarily going to turn out, even after a technically successful. That's exactly right. That's exactly kind of like right. what I've heard. Yeah, I totally agree. Because um, you, you know, I, basically, as far as the interventional side of things goes, uh, we're getting to the point where. Um, well-trained neurointerventionalists are, are very good at getting um, often a certain angiographic result and unfortunately it doesn't always correlate with the, the clinical uh, outcome that we all hope for. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, the, the modern, the you know, the latest generation of devices have 80, 90 plus percent success rate in, in recanalization, but if you saw those those devices were used in the trials that I mentioned, and the you know modified ranking of zero, one, or two is still only in the high forties. Right. So it it's uh, you often get some improvement, but it seems it it's rarely the miracle cure kind of procedure that it, it's sometimes uh, made out to be. Yeah, agree. Right. Um, so still waiting to see if there's any other questions. I don't know if we have any yet. Um, yes. Okay. Got a couple at least one here. So let's go here. So Eric Smith, thanks for joining Eric. Uh, Eric is actually going on to do neuroradiology and interventional neuroradiology. So thanks for joining Eric. Uh, he said, what kind of neuroprotective agents are being used and are there any new medications on the horizon? Uh, you know, unfortunately, this is one of those things that there have been 80 bajillion things tried in vitro in animal models and nothing really has has borne out in vivo, in human trials at least. There was some, there was like one trial from probably a decade ago about minocycline, which is an antibiotic that nobody really uses for, for infections, um, that that showed some very modest benefit. But that's the, to my knowledge, the only one that was really in any sort of widespread clinical practice and it was not even that widespread. But to my knowledge, nothing new, certainly nothing dramatic and profound that I've heard about that's on the horizon, I'm sorry to say. But, you know, obviously, um, there of all the things we can do, we're always sort of like working from a mechanical clot removal standpoint. But gosh, if there's something we could do like on the ambulance or whatever, then great. There was a it was a trial on magnesium that was on the West Coast in LA, I think, that involved EMS giving suspected ischemic stroke patients magnesium quickly. It was called a fast mag trial. Um, and, you know, it's sort of a proof of concept. Could you give people things quickly if they, if, you know, in the hopes that it might work and, you know, bad news first, it didn't work, but the good news is we were able to give patients that medication quickly 
so that if we find some agent down the line, that that is a, a possibility. Good question. Yeah, that's that's a great and really interesting question. And I've seen some things about kind of the basic science research that goes into it's being done on neuroprotective agents, and it's really interesting. It, it it seems to me like if something could be found that did work, it would it would change it just as much as if not more than a thrombectomy and TPA. Yep. 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 Um, so Brett Donigan asks, I'm wondering if you have any advice for uh, radiologists or IRs who haven't had the background in neurosciences, um, any basic clinical mistakes you see or post-procedure care that's lacking? Hey, Brett, good to, good to hear from you. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think that the, the post-procedure care, if I have to think of one thing, blood pressure management is the biggie. And there, there are actually some, one of my coworkers actually is working on um, thinking about best blood pressure goals post-procedurally. In theory, once someone's vessel has been reopened, there's no reason for them not to be normotensive but she's looking at that to see what actually the best blood pressure range is for someone post-procedurally. You know, not too high, not too low, but who knows, we, I guess she's looking in to see what range of blood pressure is best. Um, and then I think to your first question about folks who don't have background in neuroscience, I think, you know, as much as you can, like elective time allows, or you're able to spend some time on the inpatient side, taking care of acute stroke patients, the better. You know, I think that it's one thing to talk about stroke in the abstract, but caring for stroke patients is really complicated as you as you probably know. And so the more you can, the better, because for me, you know, personally, it's one of the things that drew me to stroke is because I love neurology, I love neuroanatomy, but I also like medicine and cardiology and vascular surgery. So thinking about all those skills being really important for these patients. Great, and Brett always also had a follow-up question, which is, do you have any thoughts on acute stinting for tandem lesions versus a delayed endarterectomy or stint? That's a good question. You know, I don't know the answer to that. I think something that we were, our group was talking about recently is that there had previously been data to say that acute CEA, you know, acute management with CEA is beneficial, like only in the first seven to 14 days. And that maybe is not true anymore. And I'm, I, I'll be honest, I don't know the data for that one. Um, but I think that here, at least, we tend to do endovascular intervention more than we tend to do open neurosurgical procedures. Um, and a tandem lesion is complicated, obviously, just to make sure people know that word. So if someone has, let's say, both a tandem carotid lesion and an MCA lesion, you can open up a carotid um, just, to have a, just to have a stenosed MCA. Um, so I think, you know, I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't know the answer to that one, but... Um, yeah, sorry, don't know. And um, we'll take a couple more minutes to any other questions. Uh, one that I was wondering about is, I was wondering if you could um, tell me, tell us a little bit about how the process runs at Vanderbilt in terms <clears throat> of um, kind of uh, the process that it goes from uh, code stroke to confirmation kind of talked about the imaging and then when does the neurointerventional team get called in um, and how and then do they round on those uh, patients post procedurally and all that yeah sure so when we have sometimes it's from the ER but sometimes it can even be from like EMS we'll get a notification of a stroke patient that's either physically in the hospital or in route um, in our we have a like group pager sort of thing that goes out. And if the patient's stroke scale is above six or six and above, then at that point, the interventionalists get included on the group page that goes out. And then once the patient hits the ER, they get, they, you know, like within minutes get a non-con CT and then CTA. And then it's at that point after the CTA, between the CTA and the CT perfusion, which we do as part of our routine stroke, acute stroke evaluation, the contrast needs like a four minute washout between CTA and CT perfusion. So it's at that point that typically it's the neurology resident who does a NIH stroke scale and then updates that group to say, yeah, the stroke scale was, you know, the patient was billed as whatever, and now their stroke scale is actually 22 or actually zero or whatever. And then at that point, the stroke fellow or the stroke attending are involved. 
waiting for the images to come through. And then we, I think like most people, increasingly use rapid for our perfusion imaging. And within minutes of the scan getting done, we even get an email, a de-identified email, but an email with the patient's CT perfusion. And we can see, you know, yep, it looks like this is all ischemic core or wow, this is a whole MCA territory worth of penumbra. We all get that. And then within minutes, we're on the phone with the interventionalist to say, hey, you hear about this lady in the ER? Yep, aspects is 10. Yep, CT perfusion looks good. Okay, we'll take her, that sort of thing. I think one of the things that the process really happens nicely here at Vanderbilt um, is that we are in good communication with each other. We meet often, we have conferences together. So we, you know, someone knows if I'm calling them at two o'clock in the morning, it's not just to like say, hey, and yap about a patient, it's to say, hey, this is someone who I think would benefit from intervention. Great. And we'll take this one as the last question. This is another one from Eric, and he's wondering, do the TPA guidelines and post-therapy goals differ if it's a posterior circulation stroke? That's a great question, Eric. You know, unfortunately, the trials, at least, that I've talked about today have all been for anterior circulation stroke. We know that posterior circulation strokes are sort of more scary when someone has a mid-basal occlusion or a vert occlusion, but these trials really just looked at carotid terminus, M1, M2, maybe A1. Um, but all these trials were anterior circulation trials. You know, I, I, I maybe heard, maybe I'm making this up, but I think I've heard that posterior circulation trials are in the works. But I think that for most stroke neurologists and most neurointerventionalists, if we see someone with a high stroke scale and a, you know, mid basal occlusion or a vert occlusion, then it's sort of you're between a rock and a hard place. And I think most of us would, depending on the situation, be aggressive in terms of, in, in terms of, it, it be aggressive in doing a thrombectomy in a patient who is otherwise eligible for it. Great. Well, Dr. Zimmerman, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this excellent presentation and uh, answering our questions. I think this has been very educational and uh, this video will be uploaded to the YouTube channel uh, probably in a few days to a week or so. So uh, available for review. I actually uh, at the beginning of uh, the year during my neurology rotation reviewed uh, your presentation from a couple years ago and uh, it was very beneficial. So uh, we're glad to have that resource available. Um, so thanks again for uh, joining us and taking the time. Really appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you all, everybody, for attending. Uh, we will have, we're planning to have one more uh, neuro focused webinar. Uh, this one is going to be in June. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for more details, but tentatively, June 18th, we'll be having a webinar kind of specifically about the technique of thrombectomy. So I'm sure a lot of you will be interested to hear about that from Dr. Bad Um So, with that said, we'll. Uh, See you all later and everybody take care. Thanks guys. All right. Thanks Dr. Zimmerman.